My main professional job has been as an astronomer and a space scientist, and I've been very lucky to have been working through several decades now, but each decade has brought exciting new developments. And if I look at what's been happening now, what I'm thinking about at the moment, one issue is the very beginning of the universe. Can we understand the Big Bang right at the start when we have only indirect evidence and when the physics is uncertain? And in particular, can we understand how much bigger physical reality is than the part we can actually observe? We can observe a huge volume, many, many galaxies, out to 13 billion light years from us, but there's no reason to think that that's all of physical reality. Any more than if you're in the middle of the ocean, you don't think that the uh, horizon you see around you is the end of the ocean. And we want to know how much further reality extends than the domain we can see. And almost everyone thinks it goes a great deal further, but it may go so far that all combinatorial options are fulfilled, that uh, there are avatars of us far away, making the right decision when we make the wrong one, etc. So that's a possibility. And even more interesting is that our Big Bang may not be the only one. There may be other Big Bangs, and they may give rise to universes, as it were, which are governed by different physical laws, because many of the theories of fundamental physics suggest that there are many different so-called vacuum states and they can give rise to different laws. And this leads to an idea which makes some physicists foam at the mouth, but which I think has to be taken seriously, which is called anthropic reasoning. The idea that perhaps what we think of as the laws of nature are just sort of parochial bylaws. There are some deep underlying laws, uh, but what we see in the part of the universe we can observe are just local manifestations. And if that's the case, then of course, they're not a typical manifestation because many of these universes will be sterile or stillborn. They will not allow complex phenomena to happen, no stars, no chemistry, no life. And we're in one that does allow these complexities. And to try and put on a firm footing, I think is a big challenge for the next 50 years. I won't live to see that done. Um, but in fact, the other thing that's exciting now is I suppose, in a sense, another Copernican revolution, but on cosmically a much smaller scale. This is the realization that uh, our solar system is just one of zillions of planetary systems around other stars. In fact, we didn't know that these planets around other stars existed um, even 20 years ago. People speculate they did, but the first one was found in 1995. Um, but now, we have literally thousands that have been discovered, and it's fairly clear that most stars are orbited by retinues of planets, just as the sun is orbited by the Earth and the other familiar planets. And many of these planets are very different from the Earth, of course, but enough of them are like the Earth for us to suspect that there are literally billions of planets in our galaxy. And remember, our galaxy is one of billions in the universe, planets on which conditions were rather like on the young Earth and where life could have evolved. At the moment, we only have indirect evidence for these planets. We don't see them. We see them or we infer them through the effect they have on their parent star. The best way to detect them is that if a planet transits in front of a star, then it blocks out a bit of a light from the star, so the star looks slightly fainter. So a signature for a planet is if a star shows regular dips, and then another dip and another dip each time the planet comes round. And that is a method that has led to the discovery of thousands of planets. And from that kind of evidence, you can infer how big the planet is from how much of the starlight it blocks out, and of course what the length of the, its year is from how frequently you see the recurrent dips. So we have that kind of evidence, but of course we'd really like to observe these planets directly and not just see their shadows as it were. At the moment, we only have indirect evidence for these planets. We don't see them, we see them or we infer them through the effect they have on their parent star. Or we infer them and from that a kind of evidence you can infer, you can infer, and that's why I'm very keen to support um, 
uh, Yuri Milner, a Russian investor, uh, who's um, put a substantial sum of money, $10 million a year for 10 years, uh, into the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Well, what do we expect to find? Um, my personal view is that if we find something, it is not going to be the sort of civilization that people talk about. When you look at, if we think of uh, what's happened on Earth, then there's been four billion years of evolution, and for a few millennia, there's been some kind of civilization, organized human groups leading eventually to technology and the uh, world we live in today. If we extrapolate, then of course the uh, extrapolation we get depends on whether we listen to someone like Ray Kurzweil or someone more conservative. But I think even though the rate of progress is uncertain, the direction of travel is pretty well agreed and it's almost certainly going to be um, towards a post-human world where our intelligences would be surpassed by something which will either be genetically engineered from us or, more likely, is going to be some sort of uh, um, artificial, some electronic device which uh, has uh, not all human capabilities but has uh, uh, robotic abilities and, and intelligence. That therefore means the following. If we were to detect some other planet on which life had taken a course rather similar to what's happened here on Earth, it's unlikely that its development there would be sufficiently synchronized with the development here that we would catch it when it's in the, those few, few millennia when we've got technology which is uh, controlled by organic beings like us. If it's lacking behind, what's happened on Earth, then of course we'll see no evidence for anything artificial. On the other hand, if it's ahead, then what we will detect, if we detect any evidence that that civilization existed, will be something which is uh, uh, mechanical, which was machines. And those machines maybe uh, will not be on a planet because they may not want gravity, they don't want water, etc. So they may be in space. So I think if the Euro Miller program detects anything, then it's likely to be some um, artifact which is created by some long dead uh, civilization. Um, and it's unlikely, therefore, that it be any kind of coded message intended for us, but it might be something which we could cle clearly see was not something which emerged naturally. And that would in itself be be very exciting. Um, to expand in a bit more detail about what's going to happen here on Earth um, uh, that might lead to this takeover by post-humans in some form, um, I, it leads to another fascinating question, which is um, the future for spaceflight and manned spaceflight. <coughs> uh, another of the things I've been fascinated by uh, since when I was young, I remember reading about Neil Armstrong and, and all that and thinking at that time that it would only be 10 more years before there were human footsteps on Mars. But of course, but we know that what happened was that... Uh, <laughs> and of course, what we've seen in the last 40 years has been humans just going around in low Earth orbit, but huge developments in miniaturization and in robotic probes. Um, uh, let, think of the um, pictures we had sent back from Pluto, um, just last year, here before last, from NASA's New Horizon, Pluto is 10,000 times further away than the Moon is, and we had these very clear pictures of it. And what was remarkable about those pictures was that they were based on 1990s technology, because the space probe had taken 10 years to get to Pluto, and of course, the design has to be frozen several years before launch. And if we think how uh, smartphones have evolved in the last 10 or 15 years, one knows how much better we can do now in sending miniaturized probes throughout the solar system. I and mean, that's what we do for science. But I still hope that people will go. But I think they will go not in the style of NASA astronauts. Um, they will go. Um, more in the kind of uh, 
um, mode being envisaged by uh, Elon Musk's SpaceX and these other private pioneers. And they're the kind of people who will be the first colonizers on Mars. I think that's the way it would go. I don't think Elon Musk is realistic when he imagines sending people a hundred at a time for a normal life because Mars is going to be far less clement than living at the South Pole and not many people want to do that. So I don't think there'll be many uh, ordinary people who want to go, but there will be some crazy pioneers who will want to go even if they have one-way tickets. And the reason that's important is the following, that I suspect that we are going to want to control here on Earth by regulation the application of genetic modification and of cyborg techniques on grounds of ethics and of prudence. But if we imagine these guys living as pioneers on Mars, they're out of range of any terrestrial regulation. And moreover, they've got a far higher incentive to modify themselves or their descendants to adapt to this very alien and hostile environment. So they will use all the techniques of genetic modification, which 50 years from now will be, of course, far more powerful than they already are today, and also cyborg techniques, and maybe even uh, linking themselves or downloading themselves into machines. And so the post-human era is going to start probably not here on Earth, but it's going to be spearheaded by these communities on Mars. AI and generalized machine learning, of course, are topics where I'm a follower, I'm in no sense an expert, but it's clear that they are surging ahead very fast now. Some of the key ideas actually developed in the 1980s and 90s from a guy called Jeff Hinton, um, but they've only been realizable because of the uh, greater um, processing power of modern computers, because the learning which is done by these methods requires analyzing a huge amount of data. I mean, So there is this important development in generalized machine learning uh, which um, enables the machines to actually uh, uh, learn without being programmed in detail. And this is an important breakthrough and I think we should rightly acclaim it. And I think um, we can expect very rapid progress because people sometimes say, uh, well, if you look at the history of AI, um, there have been these false dawns. There was one in the 1960s, um, and then there was another one in the 1990s, and now there's another one. Um, but uh, this time it is different, and the reason it is different is that it's got above the threshold when there's commercial interests and lots of money being thrown at it. And uh, I am fortunate to have got to know some of the people in this field, I'm not an expert, particularly the, the people at uh, Google Deep Mind, which is a company based in London, and um, they are uh, very keen to interact with academia um, and also blur the boundary between academia and commercial um, work. But so far, there has been a, a very interesting dialogue between those in academia um, and uh, those in the commercial world. And that's not just on the ethics, but also on the, on the science, because the other um, interest uh, is uh, uh, what's um, sort of exemplified uh, best by Dan Dennett, for instance, which is the, uh, uh, the nature of artificial intelligence and uh, the extent to which it is like human intelligence and the extent to which consciousness is part of it. Um, and uh, this is, uh, of course, a classic philosophical problem. So there are clearly deep philosophical questions about what are the limits of AI, what will change if we have quantum computers, um, and uh, uh, to what extent um, are these um, uh, going to be uh, conscious beings, because clearly they will have more and more human capabilities, um, and this raises the philosophical question of, of uh, t is consciousness an emergent property of any sufficiently complicated system, or is it something which is special to the kind of wet hardware in our skulls and the fact that we are linked to a, a body? Uh, this is a very old question, and it's still an important question. And of course, it has, um, uh, as we know from the movies, but it's a serious issue too, implications for how we should treat these robots when they're seemingly intelligent. And the question is, are we going to have to start worrying about whether robots are underemployed or bored, um, as we would if they were things with a, a consciousness? We just don't know if we're going to have to do that.